I don't see the world the same way most people do. Like you said, that that programming is to go to school, get a job that society tells you to do. But both paths, either path is fine. You're listening to the Presidential Experience Podcast, the place where we chronicle man's search for meaning over money. I'm your host, Kene Corder, National Certified Counselor and Clinical Hypnotherapist specializing in financial therapy for high achievers. As a former Morgan Stanley Financial Advisor, I realized that high achievers need to help with more than just the numbers. And I bring a unique set of skills to my private practice as I guide CEOs and high achievers on how to manage their stress so they can enjoy their success. I want to bring some of that to you here. So each week, we'll start a discussion addressing one of the top stressors for high achievers. You've built a stellar resume. Now it's time for you to build a stellar life. Your hard work brought you money. Now it's time to turn that money into meaning here on the Presidential Experience Podcast. Hey there, my prosperity pros. Welcome to this edition of Presidential Experience Podcast. I'm your host, Kenei Corder, National Certified Counselor and the world's number one clinical hypnotherapist specializing in financial therapy and stress management. For this CEO conversation episode, we are speaking to another EO member, Evan Nierman. He is going to help us explore the topic of crisis management and public relations, whether it's a public scandal or an international pandemic, having a plan and being prepared for a crisis is important, especially when your audience starts to get bigger, when you become a bigger influencer, when you're more in the limelight. And I'll explain a little bit about that later, but the bigger your audience gets, the bigger the crisis can be. Anyway, before I talk about that, first, let me introduce you to our guest today. Evan Nierman is founder and CEO of public relations and crisis management agency, Red Banyan. Red Banyan executes effective public relations and strategic communications campaigns for national and international clients. Evan is a deeply experienced communications professional who has provided counsel to senior business leaders, high-profile individuals, and government officials. Evan is smart, strategic, interesting, and very passionate about the details of his work. Today, he is going to help us chronicle the search for meaning over money as we address managing stress using public relations and crisis management. So guys, please join me in welcoming our guest today. It's going to be a lot of fun to hang out with Evan Nierman. Hey, Evan. Hey, hey, how you doing? It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be with you too. I feel like we're like old friends now. Like you, you just know all the, the deep and dirty secrets of presidential lifestyle. <laughs> well, keep in mind, as part of my job, people tell me their most sensitive <laughs> secrets, and they trust me to keep them to myself or to, or to tell them in the right way. So don't worry. Just like I tell my <laughs> clients, all your secrets are safe with me. Yay! Thank Unless you. Unless you're recording this and you know putting it out on a podcast or something. Dang it. <laughs> so I'm so happy to hang out with you. And you probably know we ask every guest one question to start off with to kick the conversation off. And that is, what is your idea of prosperity? Such a good question. And I have an easy answer. It's pretty mm-hmm. simple. For me, prosperity is health and happiness. Mm-hmm. If I'm healthy, And I'm feeling happy about my life and I'm bringing joy to other people's lives. I've got everything. I'm the most prosperous person that walked the earth. And I got to tell you, I I know lots of people who may have more financial resources than I do. uh, But I feel like I'm one of the most prosperous people that I've ever met. And for that, I'm deeply, deeply thankful. Mm, I like that. And what you just ended with too, that gratitude kind of adds to that that happiness and adds to that idea of prosperity when you're when you're thankful for the life you have. Would you agree? Absolutely. And I agree with people who say, you know, happiness is a choice. 
you can have a the, the fact pattern can be exactly the same and you can wake up on a Monday in kind of a bad mood and you're unhappy with where you sit and you're wishing you had this or you're envying someone else. Mm-hmm. Tuesday you may wake up and you, you're you haven't fundamentally changed your life but your outlook can be radically different. And to a large extent, I believe that we have the ability and the power and the opportunity to control that. Mm, Yeah, we do. And that's kind of, that still goes into the work that you do, right? That's part of that is your lifestyle and and your mindset, but that also is part of the work that you do. Am I right? Well, in this job, optimism is essential because when you're dealing, especially with companies or individuals who are facing a crisis, what they're looking for in that moment is someone who can guide them through the storm, can get them through the rough seas and take them to a place uh, where they can move forward with their lives, with their business. So I don't believe positivity is is an option mm. because it's something that I absolutely I have to deliver for the clients and my team has to deliver for our clients because as I said, when people are in need and when they're facing complex, dangerous circumstances, they're looking for a steady hand to guide them and being decisive and being strong and being positive and helping them see and believe and develop a sense of certainty that you will get through this. We can help you. It's really an essential element of the work that we do. That is so good. It's so true. And as a therapist, that's sort of the work that we do too. And it seems like there's sort of a, I know therapy is in your family and your background, but it seems like there's sort of a therapy element there too, for you to keep them so poised and prepared through the process, would you say? Absolutely. I mean, there's actually not a week that goes by where I don't jokingly talk about uh, my role as a therapist to the clients with my team members. And it's not just me who serves that that role for them. N- not that this consulting that we do on communications is any replacement for the kind of work that you do. I would argue it's it's actually great for people to get counsel in a variety of different areas. And, and I think every single person who walks the earth can benefit from working with a therapist but as you as you pointed out, a lot of the times the the role that I, that I'm playing or that my colleagues are playing when we're guiding clients is we're, we're advising them on the on the realm of, of communication and public relations and crisis management. And at the same time, there is very much a a drawing on the same kinds of skills that are so essential for a good therapist. You got to be a great listener, and you've got to have really high EQ and mm-hmm. know. As you're talking to someone, l- l- paying attention to the the subtle subtleties in their speech, or if you're doing it as in a video chat or in person, uh, looking at their their body language and, and reading between the lines and really understanding what's making them uncomfortable, what do they feel more excited about, and and being able to to be, as I mentioned before, that calming force for them. And literally talking them down sometimes when they're spiraling themselves up and helping them understand you need to come back to a, a place where of positivity, we are going to get through this together. I'm here for you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you tell your story and press the truth. Mm. So luckily we're not on video because then you'd see that my legs are crossed, my arms are crossed. I'm sitting back in my chair and you probably would be judging me, but I'm totally enjoying and thoroughly into what you're saying. (laughs) And it doesn't mean I'm not interested, but when you talk about body language, it's like the way that I am sitting right now is not indicative of how I feel. So what I hear you saying is the person might not even be conscious of what they're doing, but you have to, you are, you're conscious of what they're doing and the messages they're sending out. Even if it's not what they want to send out, you need to call them on it and help them become aware of what message they're sending out when they're not even trying it. I agree with that. And I I suspect if you were sitting here with me, you wouldn't probably have that same posture. You'd be adopting more of the posture that I have right now. Um, I'm actually spread out. My legs are, are, um, there's a lot of space between them. I'm leaning forward. Mm. I'm actively 
engaged and I'm leaning towards you, even though it's just an image of you on the computer screen. So mm. I, I'm into this conversation and I'm excited about what we're doing. And I'm yeah. even gesturing with my hands and my eyebrows are moving around and I'm pointing for emphasis, even though you can't see it. But a mm. lot of times your, your voice, though, uh, does reflect what your body is doing as well. It really does. And and it goes back to that happiness that you talked about, because that comes through. If you are if you're down, sometimes just changing your positions or your state, you know, your physical state can change your mental state. A hundred percent. And in fact, one of the, what, what I think is one of the most valuable Ted talks that's out there. I'm sure you watch a lot, a lot of Ted talks mm -hmm. just as I do is, uh, Amy Cuddy, who's a professor at Harvard, who has a fantastic Ted talk that talks about how your body language changes your mind. And she actually draws upon scientific studies that show simply changing your body posture changes the chemical makeup in your body and gives you more, more energy, more positivity. It's, it's a must listen or must view for, for everyone out there. And I actually encourage my team members to do what I do is before I go into a situation where I'm presenting or I'm going into an important meeting, I will actually change my body posture for a couple of minutes in anticipation of the meeting so that it changes me mentally as well. Mm. It's a great yeah. life hack. It is. It is. And I, I have one too, like right before I speak. So of course they're going to introduce me, but I don't even listen to that introduction. I have another introduction. It is kind of like the future introduction because I'm not a New York Times bestselling author yet. But in the, the way that I describe myself in my like manifestation introduction, I introduce myself that way. So I kind of close my ears to what they're saying. And in my head, I'm doing my future introduction, which gives me even more power. So when I go out on that stage, I'm like on 10 because I just feel like that person that I just described. And that adds to that level of confidence that you need to go out there and command the stage, whether it's a person, a stage of one, because sometimes it is just one powerful person that you're meeting with. And that can be scarier than meeting with a, a room full of 10,000 people. It can be mm -hmm. um, because when you're on a stage, you know, for those of us who, who've had the opportunity to speak to groups with the stage lights in your eyes, um, it's actually, you don't connect with someone from the stage to the audience in the same way that you do when you're sitting face to face with, with, a, with an actual person with whom you're having a conversation. So it can actually be less person. It's certainly less personal. And I tend not to get jitters about speaking to big groups because you can really only realistically see some of the people in front of you. Mm -hmm. And once you get to speaking to bigger and bigger rooms, it's impossible to see everyone out there. That's so true. And then you did, it just kind of glazes over to just like a, yeah, just like one big blur. And so they, they, I'm with you. That nervousness is not the same when you are speaking to, let's just say, two or three people in a room where you can look at each person and you can see every expression on their faces as you talk and you're like, oh, shit, she didn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I mean, look, I'll, I'll give you an example that that. I got teased by my colleagues because uh, I, I was giving a, a TEDx talk at the headquarters of Oracle out west in California. And I, if you would have asked me how it went, I'd say, I think it went great. The audience seemed to be really into what I was saying. Uh, however, when they went and posted the video online, about halfway through the talk, someone gets up on like the second or the third row and just walks right down the aisle out of the room in the middle of the presentation. And I, they were, they were teasing me in the, in my office. I said, well, I guess there was at least one person who didn't like your talk too much. I know. Right. And I don't know if you've ever seen Nina Simone's documentary, but um, you know, the singer Nina Simone, she used to tell people if they did that, she sit back down, sit down. And she would stop the show and like sit down and would not start back until they sat down. 
okay. I'm not sure that you, that that's something I would endorse. It is not. No, but it is uh, not. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> if you want someone to think of you as a diva, that sounds like a great strategy. <laughs> exactly. No, no, no. I don't think you would endorse that at all. That behavior is unacceptable. But yeah, but I thought that was interesting when I heard that about her. So you could have employed that if you want it to be known. I have, but my whole point was I didn't even see the person. I thought I had them all, you know, eating out of the palm of my hand and they were giving me rapt attention. Little did I know they were running for the exit. <laughs> And that's the great part about it because it doesn't change you in the moment because you're delivering and, and that means you're all the way in. And if you are influenced by the audience, whether that one person walked away, everybody else could have been in because not everybody is going to resonate with what you say. So if it's 90 people in the room and that one person walks out, you still at 89 to speak to and not let your focus get taken away by that one person. Well, thank you. I feel better about myself now. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah. You're really good at this. <laughs> so I'm wondering, so that, so that's a bit, kind of a mindset. That's your mindset that we're talking about. And it can easily be shifted and a crisis and especially a big crisis um, can shift it quickly, like catastrophic event and bam, brain is gone. You, you're in the amygdala, you are all emotional and your logic is out the door. What do people do to stay focused, I guess is the word, or stay logical um, in the face of a crisis? Well, many of them don't. And that's why I have a job. And mm. uh, that's why we have a critical role to do as crisis managers is because when when you're actually talking about a crisis or learning about someone else's situation, it has a fundamentally different impact on you physiologically, psychologically, than when you are the person in the midst of that crisis. And I think everyone out there can knows what I'm talking about when I say that there's been that moment before where you you did something that you shouldn't have done, and then there's that moment of realization, and you've just got that pit in your stomach, and you feel flushed, and maybe your throat is dry, and you're feeling anxious and nervous. Well, when a person is in a crisis, that's going on for a prolonged period of time. And so it's very, very difficult to make rational, smart, strategic decisions when you're in the midst of the crisis, and that's why it's so valuable to bring in someone who is a, a dispassionate outsider who can step in, keep a cool head, and has the experience of having guided other people through, most of the time, similar circumstances, um, and, and not in the pressure of the moment, relying strictly on yourself to make rational decisions. That's a, that's a recipe for making big mistakes and mm. further compounding your crisis. Mm, okay. So originally my follow-up question to that was how do they get there? But it sounds like you answered that. And that is don't expect themselves to get themselves there. They need that outside third party to be able to put those pieces together that they can't even see from inside the crisis. Cause technically that's where they are inside the crisis. And because you're that neutral third party, you are outside the crisis and you can see it from a different vantage point than they can see it. So you can put pieces together that they might not even be able to see. Absolutely. Or be a sounding board and, and provide input because a lot of times people in crisis, what do they do immediately? They reach out to those who they know care about them the most, whether that's family members or colleagues or friends. And so sometimes by the time we get the call, we're actually helping that individual also sift through a confusing barrage of sometimes contradictory messages from other people. And I think the way, the way that I would describe this, look, I'm, we're talking about it in very philosophical terms right now, I'll give you a concrete example from the last 24 hours that I think speaks to this. Uh, we got a phone call from someone who was in a, in a state of crisis yesterday. Th this call came in yesterday. The person's in a state of crisis because this individual was targeted by someone online who tricked him 
into getting naked over a webcam. Holy crap. Five minutes after that call ended, and the guy's thinking to himself, wow, I just had a great webcam experience with a very attractive woman who found me on this dating app. I'm pretty impressed with myself. He actually got an, an email in his inbox that said, check out this video. If you don't want me posting it on the internet and sending it to all of your friends and family and your work colleagues and everyone in your network, you need to pay me immediately by wiring money to this bank account. So it was a, a straight up extortion. And this person called me because he was actually getting these emails in real time while I was talking to him. I could hear the computer refreshing with new messages from this person. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, the most important thing I did was calm the individual down and prevent him from making big mistakes. Mm -hmm. He he talked to a couple people who said, "Oh, you need to you need to jump ahead of this immediately. You should get your story out there. You should send something right away to all of your business contacts and everyone in your network and tell them what happened." And he was prepared to do that, and I didn't believe that was the right approach. So, you know, I I told him what I thought he should do, and I think probably most importantly, this gets back to that therapist role, you know, what I said to this person was, look, what I can tell you is you're going to be okay right now in the moment. It, it feels like you're not, but you will be, we'll get through this. Uh, we will manage it. We will mitigate the negative impact and life will go on. Our team can help you. We're going to fight for you. We're going to help you. We're going to guide you, but take a deep breath. Um, it is going to be okay. We got you. And I think just those words spoken to someone who really needs to hear them can be very powerful. That is so true. That is so true. Those words alone, one, just like making sure that the person knows they're not alone. You know, that's a big part of what you said. And then the second part is that this too shall pass kind of thing. Like, okay, this is big, but know that this does have an ending. You know what? It may not be a happy ending necessary. It might not be a Disney ending, but it is going to end and we're going to do our absolute best, which means that it's not going to just be, well, we'll see what happens. Let Just let it happen. No, there's some control taken. We're going to take control, control the controllables. And so there's so many parts in what you said was so simple, but there was, it was layers of um, like protection in that sentence. Yeah. And that's the, that's the therapy part of it, like you said. That's the therapy part of it because when you think you're alone, it is nothing, no feeling, quite like feeling like you're alone in something. It is devastating to go through a crisis, but to go through a crisis alone is even more devastating. Absolutely. And that's why we want them to know um, we got your back. We're going to help you. We're going to guide you through this. And like you said, this too shall pass. And it always does. So I know that your job is helping others manage their stress and their crisis. But what happens when you are under pressure? And I know I can already tell by talking to you and some of our pre-interview that you handle stress pretty well, but your job is pretty stressful. And, and the people around you, a lot of times when they come to you, they're stressed. Now I get you do public relations outside of crisis, but a lot of times you're dealing with crisis, right? Correct. Yep. So how do you manage that yourself? Well, the higher the stakes and the bigger the crisis and the more pressure, the more I actually go into a cool zone. And mm -hmm. so I find that I'm not sure if it's just my genetic makeup or my my personality um, or if it's just what's really required in order to get the job done. It's probably a combination of, of all of that. Mm -hmm. But during a time of crisis where especially when things are getting really hot and people are stressed and they're screaming or they're losing control, it's in those moments that I actually go ice cold and I find myself – very focused on the task at hand, what needs to happen. And I find myself not getting worked up at all. Now, that being said, 
when you take me out of those situations, uh, I'm a very impatient person. And it's, it's really one of the areas that's my biggest flaws. I'm very impatient. I know this. I've, I've continued to uh, be a work in progress. Uh, but for me, how I manage stress in my day-to-day life when I'm not dealing with one of these crisis situations, it comes down to physicality. For me, there is an absolute connection, again, between the mind and the body. And for me, I cannot manage stress and I cannot be a sane person without vigorous exercise at least six days a week. Mm, that's, that's, That's rigorous, yeah. Because, I mean, some people are working out two, three times a week, but that six days a week is dedication. Six or seven is, wow. is I mean, I don't, even on a day with it's more of a rest day, I'll, it'll be an active rest day, meaning I'll still ride bikes with my kids. I'll still get on the one wheel. I'll go for a run. I'll go for a light jog. I'll go for a walk. I'm still active on that rest day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for me, exercise has been a core part of my life and, and I believe a, a key element in what's given me both the physical and the mental stamina. Uh, to go to operate at a level that's higher than maybe the average person. Uh, I'm not saying I'm some some sort of superhuman specimen or too late, uh, but you know I can uh, I can you know there's there's this famous video of Will Smith talking online about like what dry, like what makes him special, and he basically tells this person in the interview there may be other people who are smarter than me who are more learned than me who are better looking than I am, but I won't be outworked. Mm, and, yeah, I have seen that. And, you know, I, I feel similarly, but part of the, the way that you develop that is just through routine and making exercise a, a part of your, your life day in, day out for years. And then it becomes something that you don't even have to consciously think of. You just know it's going to happen. And for me, that is, that is the essential outlet for how I relieve stress. Mm, Yeah. And some of what I hear you saying is know thyself. Like that, that is something, you know, about yourself. That is something you've learned about yourself and, and it is, it's who you are. So there's some things that are behavior and this is my philosophy. And then there's some things that are who you are. And that looks like behavior. Somebody could see that as behavior, but really it's who you are and who you are comes out in your behavior. And that's how you get to your best and highest good. Hmm, That's interesting. Well, I guess I would agree and disagree. I agree that who, maybe who I am is someone who's got a lot of discipline and drive. Uh, But I don't, I'm not an athlete. I'm not athletically gifted at all. And, you know, I was a soccer player my whole life up until college. I played four years of division one soccer in college. And after that, I, I, I gave it up because I was going to start a professional career, but it wasn't going to be as a professional soccer player. Um, and I never had the physical attributes of the other players, uh, but similar to, to the Will Smith anecdote, I spent years and years making sure that I developed skills that take time to develop. So I I don't, you know, some people are gifted athletes by nature. In my case, I just think it was more, that was one area where I could apply the drive that was innate. Exactly. Who you are is that drive. So not the athlete, that's not who you are. The drive is who you are. So that's going to show up. And everything you do, it's not going to just show up in how you perform as a soccer player or as a cyclist or whatever it is that you're doing for that day running. It, that's going to show up. That drive shows up in everything you do because that is who you are. I think you're right. <laughs> See, I told you I was good at this. Am, am I going to have to pay a bill at the end of this? <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm okay if I do, but I just... Would... <laughs> Because no, I'm, no, I'm no. getting a, I'm getting a lot out of this, so uh, <laughs> I'm almost feeling like I need to write you a check right now. <laughs> no, this one is on me. This is pro bono. Okay, all right. Yeah, well, thank you. this is the this is the benefit of being my friend. All my friends get <laughs> get free, free, free. I don't even call this therapy. It's just like you know, it's just free caneism. Okay, I'll take it. 
<laughs> I know. And I'm enjoying this conversation so much because you bring to the table this incredible expertise. And then when you have this know-how, this, this, um, and really call it this, this certain something, you know, the French, they say this je ne sais quoi. And so this, you have this certain something and, and all of us do, but you know, yours and you found something that you can use this je ne sais quoi in your daily work. That is so meaningful, but not everybody gets to experience that. What is that feeling like? It's an amazing feeling. And it's, it's something that it took me years to figure out exactly what path I needed to be on. And, you know, entrepreneurship is something that for me is, is a perfect fit with my personality. And I stumbled into it and it was not something that I set out to do. And it was something that I I didn't even start the business until I'd already worked eight years at my first job, two years at the next, two years at the next. So I'd already put in 12 years uh, but during those 12 years, I was gaining the life experience and the professional experience and honing the skills uh, that made it possible for me to launch the firm like I did and then to be able to grow the firm. So, you know, I was, I was reflecting. I know one of the things that you always ask, ask your guests is, you know, what's the piece of business advice that you wish you'd had or mm-hmm. the most valuable? And for me, it's it's not a single piece of advice as much as to just know that you can find your path and you can pursue an entrepreneurial experience. And when I tell you, it, I, it just, it had never crossed my mind growing up. Uh, I had always sort of been taught, you go to school, you get, you go to the best school you can, you get the best grades you can, then you get the best job you can, and then you work your way up that corporate ladder. And that was fine. And I was quite good at that. And I did enjoy it. And I had some amazing experiences along the way. But if I had to go back and, and, and talk to my younger self, I would have let me know, if you believe in yourself, and you've got unique abilities, which all of us do, there is a way to chart your own course and to take your own path. And so I'm trying to, to do a good job. I've got two kids. My son is 13. My daughter's turning 11 soon. And I've tried to, to do for them what, what I didn't have the opportunity in terms of having a parent uh, really focus on entrepreneurship and encourage that finding of your own passions and your path. And my hope is that my kids, they'll, they'll find their own path. And at least even if they decide that's not for them, and to to work for a big corporation or something is is a better fit. At least they know that there is this other path out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so good because part of my story is that my parents worked corporate and they both got laid off in the same year. And so they raised us to be entrepreneurs. And I was older by the time they started t- since it, this happened when I was 18 years old, but it was like, go to school, of course, get a degree because you'd always have that to fall back on. But your plan A should be the entrepreneurship and the job should be the the plan B. That shouldn't be your you know focus. And so it's it's interesting because I don't see the world the same way most people do. Like you said, that, that programming is to go to school, get a job that society tells you to do. But both paths, either path is fine. You had a great life at in your corporate life. And then you had a, a, an amazing life as an entrepreneur, just really being able to live out your, your true passion. And now you can tell people what both sides look like and teach your children what both sides look like so they can experience it for themselves and then decide on the other side, which one is best for them. Couldn't have said it better myself. You nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. So I have, uh, we are coming to the end and you kind of already answered my last question, which then makes me say, well, I guess I have two more questions since you already answered. Because would you say that is the best advice you've ever received or the advice you wish somebody would have told you? That's our, that's our question. Yep. That's Um, what I'm, okay. That's that's what I'm going with. So now, so now you're going to have to on the fly, come up with something else (laughs) to throw at me. Okay. So I'm going to go with 
So I, I'm toying between these two. And if you listen to the podcast, I'm usually toying between the last couple of questions. And I'm like, oh, how do we end this powerfully? Um, and I think it's around survival, survival and sacrifice, because I know that you have pushed through some things. And so can you talk to us a little bit about what it is to maintain or or sacrifice? I think the question that I really want to ask is when you are surviving, moving through this business, what is the driver to keep you going? Because when you are up against, do I quit or do I keep going? Something has to get you to that other side. Yeah. And I think there are, I'm not unique in that a lot of entrepreneurs, and I would venture to guess nearly all of them have had a, a moment in time where things were tough in the business and he or she thought to himself or herself, is this really worth it? Is it worth it to continue down this road? This is hard and I'm by myself and I'm, it's lonely here. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've, I've had that experience more times than I would like to admit. And I've had a business that at this point is, is 10 years old and has had an amazing growth trajectory, but it hasn't been this fantasy or this fairy tale that you get when you read the newspaper or read blogs and you, you hear about this masterful entrepreneur who comes up with a great idea and overnight success. Um, I just, I don't buy it. It happens, you know, one in a million, maybe mm -hmm. probably more like one in 10 or 20 million where you get a big success story like that. Mm -hmm. But for most of us, it's really, it's incremental improvement and growth. Um, but there has to be a level of commitment and strength that an entrepreneur possesses because without that, this is just too hard. <sighs> And the easier path is to wave the white flag to surrender and go back to plan B or whether that, you know, whatever that plan B looks like. And I think for me, you know, when I've stared down that, that decision point, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's digging deep within myself and thinking, do I have the conviction that I'm on the right road? And if I believe that I am, and if I believe in myself, I'm not going to let myself quit at this point. I'm going to push through this. And again, it's all mentality. I really believe that the power of the mind, and it sounds cliche, but I know it to be true because I've experienced it myself. Mm -hmm. And there have been moments where the business was on the line. Look, this, this past couple of months has been a very, very trying time in the midst of this global pandemic. Mm -hmm. We went through a period just a few weeks ago where none of our clients, I wouldn't say none of them, but most of our clients were suffering terrible financial losses and, and simply weren't paying their bills, not because they didn't want to pay them, but because they couldn't pay them. Mm. And there are always going to be challenges and there are going to always be these gut check moments. But if your belief in yourself is strong and you have the mental fortitude to weather a storm and to look for the clear day that's just over the horizon, you'll find a way to get through every time. And that, that for me, and, and honestly, it, it's like building a muscle. The first couple times you do it as an entrepreneur, it's, it's, it's the hardest and can can in, it can bring on the most anxiety or the most depression or just the hardest physical and psychological toll but it's like any other muscle as you strengthen it you get better and better and it grows and so at this point having spent a decade doing this i know that i've gotten through tough times before and i know that there will be unexpected twists and turns uh, but i've developed that resilience and I know that uh, I believe in myself and entrepreneurs who believe in themselves and are willing to, to stick it out and survive, when the times get tough again, they'll be able to draw upon the knowledge, not just belief that they can do it, but knowledge that they will because they've done it before. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a saying here at Presidential Lifestyle, when you believe it, you'll soon see it. And that's what I hear you saying. It's like you have that belief, you have that commitment, the strength, and sometimes you don't necessarily see the light at the end of the tunnel, but you believe that there will be a light at the end of the tunnel and you're just too far away to see it now. And if you just keep going, it will come to light. And then, aha, now you see it. That's what I hear you saying. Yes. Yeah. Um. So my last question for you is around because you kind of alluded to it in this answer, and that was around sacrifice. And I know that you and I have something in common based on our pre-interview. We put our, as a therapist, you know, the, the and when I was a financial advisor, you know, the fiduciary duty and putting the client first was important. As a therapist, putting the client first is important. And my team, putting the client, putting the team first is important. Uh, and so many times I've had to do that. And so I know that you and I have that in common. So when you have that kind of mentality, what do you sacrifice? What have you sacrificed along the way? And you might not see it as a sacrifice because it's so natural to you. But if you can dig to say what you sacrifice as you put clients first, as you put your team first, what any probably even your family before you, what do you say you have sacrificed over the years? I've definitely sacrificed a lot of time, time mm -hmm. that a lot of my contemporaries were out having a good time. I was very focused on trying to better myself, or better the business. And so there've been lots of times where I've missed out on relaxation, which I believe I'm going to, I'm going to earn it back um, mm -hmm. down the road because I'm going to be able to have I mean, basically at this point, I have the option of, you know, I, I can work for as long as I want and I can also stop working whenever I want. For me, it's not work. It's my calling and I enjoy mm -hmm. it. So it's hard for me to ever imagine this, this concept that for me is an aberration, this retirement concept, because I'm of the mentality, you find something that you love to do and then you're never working a day in your life. Mm -hmm. I've sacrificed certainly. Uh, time with my family, and I've I've forced them uh, to to have a lot of family occasions and whatnot, where uh, it would have been great for me to be there, uh, but I wasn't because I was simultaneously, you know, at the same time trying to be a great dad, be a great husband, also feeling this duty to the clients and also to uh, my team and the family members of my teammates who rely on them to be successful in their job. So, you know, just last year I was, I was with my family in new Orleans at the jazz fest. It was a great time. We were there for just several days and I got a incoming crisis call mm. and the person needed my help. And it, it, this was one of those ones where it was a literal life or death situation. It involved a loss of life and, mm. and was a very serious crisis and I left the fairgrounds, got in a taxi, went to a store, bought a suit, tie, shirt, shoes, socks, belt, everything, and left my family to, to spend the last two days there. Uh, and I got on a plane to go to New York to meet with someone. And, you know, that's a sacrifice. And yeah. I know that my kids would have liked to have me at the, uh, at the jazz fest for another day or two with them, but they also understood because I came back and I, I talked to them about the work that I'd done and how I'd tried to help this individual. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, my hope is I, I understand that, you know, especially when your kids are young, you can't ever get back time. Uh, but on the flip side, by being entrepreneurial and starting my own business, you know, it's also given me the chance to, even when I have to sacrifice times like that, the flip side is I get to do things that I couldn't do if I worked for someone else. So, you know, I could take my family backpacking in Peru for 16 days and not answer my phone, not look at email. And I can mm. give my kids that kind of life experience. So it's just like everything else in life. It comes with trade-offs. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't, I don't focus on the sacrifice and I don't hold myself up as some sort of a martyr. I just see it as 
it's it's just part of what's required if you're going to be driven and successful. Yes, it is. It is. It's definitely part of it. And it's also how your family expresses that too, is that they understand those trade-offs and they understand what their, their dad does and how they can benefit on one end. So it's like you take the good with the bad and I hate to call it good and bad because it's not quite either or, or, but you, you, you take all the parts. Let's say that you just take all the parts. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't want this to end. I am having so much fun. <laughs> well, you I'm can book like, you, you can you can book a session with me uh next week and we can we can call and we don't even have to record it. We can just chat and catch up. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Should I send you a link to my calendar or you'll send me a link to your calendar? Um, I think it's probably better for me to send you because mine's a little crazy these days. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm sure yours is good. too, though. Yeah. It's not a contest. <laughs> No, that was funny. No, you're you're right. It, it's it's an interesting time right now, and and one since you know we you and I have this really great ability. I've already learned this about you, and we have a great ability to enjoy the moment. And even though there's a lot going on in the world right now with our clients, with our families, with you know strangers, we can still be in this moment. And then get out and do our work in another moment. Absolutely. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. so, you know, look, this is a tough time for, for everybody. And, um, but just like we tell our, our clients who are in a time of crisis, we, we have to remind ourselves who are in a time of crisis that uh, this too shall pass and we will weather this storm and we will get through it. Our world is going to be forever changed. Uh, but all of us need to be prepared to 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 dig in for now and draw upon resilience because we're going to need it. Mm, yes. And I want to end on that note right there. So the last thing I would like for you to tell people, and I know you have, you know, TED Talks, and YouTube videos, where would you like people to to check for you? If people are like, man, I want to know more. I want to listen more. Tell me more about Evan. Where would they go? to connect with you? Yeah. So the, the best place is probably our website, which is redbanion.com. And we, I blog there. Um, so share a lot of thoughts. Um, you can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and also people are welcome to connect with me personally on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm happy to accept LinkedIn requests and to continuously grow my network of, of good people. So you can find us at, at any or all of the above. And as you mentioned, we do have videos on our YouTube channel as well. So love to hear from you, love to connect with you. So uh, send us an email, reach out. Um, we'd love to be in touch. Awesome. I'll put all of that in the show notes, guys. And Evan, I am just so thankful for our time together. So thanks so much for hanging out with me today. And this was yeah, this was incredible. I had a blast. Thank you for having me. So guys, thank you for staying all the way to the end, for hanging out with us and, and listening and bringing to this conversation what you bring, because we couldn't do this without you listening. And remember, every crisis does have an ending. Like we said, it may not be a happy ending, a Disney ending, but it will end. This too shall pass. And you're not alone. Many high achievers, CEOs, entrepreneurs are experiencing the same things you are going through right now. So you're not by yourself. And we can all talk this through. You know, conversation is what helps get us, get us through the hard times, whether you're talking private conversation with someone like Evan or me or in a group conversation or in a organization like EO. Just don't do this alone. So it's your choice. Just find a community. You find the one that's right for you. And really remember this. You are a prosperity pro. So keep going. Keep listening. I will see you here next week. Share this with a friend and have them join because it does not have to be lonely at the top. 
You can take people with you and I'm taking you with me and I encourage you to invite some friends. So I'll see you next week. And thanks for listening, guys. Hey, I'm wondering, do you feel like it's time to manage your stress so you can enjoy your success? Have you gotten to the point where you'd rather be appreciated for who you are rather than what you do? Well, if finding meaning in life is a high priority for you right now, and you're interested in seeing if you're a good fit for working with me and my team over here at Presidential Lifestyle, here's what I want you to do. Head on over to presidentiallifestyle.com slash private dash conversation to book a private conversation with me so we can determine what's stopping you from creating that meaningful life. You'll get on the phone with me for about 60 minutes to get to the bottom of what's stressing you right now. We'll also take a look at what you want to create, like how much money do you want to have? How healthy do you want to be? How much love do you want to give and receive? What will happen is we'll take a closer look at where you are right now, as well as where you want to be. And if me and my team can help you bridge the gap between those two, we'll show you the fastest way. We help CEOs and high achievers all over the world navigate through stress so they can enjoy their success and turn their money into meaning. So to see if we can help you do that same thing, head on over to presidentiallifestyle.com slash private dash conversation or simply click the link in the show notes. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Want to reduce your stress even more? Here are four ways you can do it. One, send us your questions. Ask us anything about money, marriage, or maturing. You can send it to podcast at presidential lifestyle. Dot com. Number two, subscribe to this podcast. You wouldn't want to miss an episode. That would be stressful. <laughs> and number three, get our prosperity report recap. It's a free resource where we share top tools and resources. Just go to presidentiallifestyle.com slash blog slash prosperity report. Don't worry, it's in the show notes. You won't have to remember that. And four, if you really want to connect with us in a deep and powerful way, join our private club. Go to joinpresidentialexperience.com to find out when our doors open again. We want you to be there so you can turn your money into meaning. And if you're enjoying this podcast, go ahead and leave us a rating and a comment and we'll be sure to thank you. And now for the legalese. Remember, this podcast is not to replace professional counsel. The best advice comes from a professional you know. The topics discussed in this podcast are general in nature and are for informational and entertainment purposes only. We encourage you to meet with a professional that you can discuss your specific situation with, whether therapeutic or otherwise. That's all for now. I'll see you next episode. And remember, you can have wealth in all of its forms. Believe it and you will soon see it. 